Well, hi, everyone. I am so excited to be joining you today as we culminate the Safe States Alliance's 30 and 30 series. Um, that series has been fe featuring 30 different achievements and landmark events to celebrate um, our organization's 30 years of kind of progress and service in the, in, in the injury and violence prevention field. I am absolutely delighted today to be joined by some past, present, and future leaders here in the field of injury and violence prevention. So thanks everyone for joining us. Um, it's one of the things that I like to do is connect and, and visit with my colleagues about um, their professional opportunities and the professional growth that they've seen in the field over the past 30 years. Um, I wonder if we might just start very simply and, and talk about how do you explain your job to those who don't work in the injury and violence prevention field. I know I often face this when I hear my my parents try to explain to one of their friends, like, what does your daughter do? What, what is her profession? And trying to think about how would I explain um, what I do? So I'm wondering if anybody wants to jump in and just kind of tell us how you explain the work that you've done in this field. Well, that's a good question, Lisa, and it's one that when I was uh, working full time in the field, I would oftentimes uh, try and answer. And so I sort of developed this elevator spiel that's very brief. And basically, I start. I would usually start by saying, my colleagues and I try and do research and programming to keep you and keep us from getting hurt. And then I go on and say that could be falls if you're elderly falls. Uh, motor vehicle crashes could be violence self-inflicted or, or violence against another person but we're just trying to keep all of us um, uh, safe and i think my elevator speech is probably pretty similar to that um given that i am in a trauma center i work in a hospital it's a little bit different but i do tell people that i um, work in injury prevention which means that as a trauma center, we look at our top mechanisms of injury, which are reasons why people are admitted to the hospital as a trauma. And we develop programs and interventions to decrease violence and injury in the community um, by working with our community partners and engaging um, people within our own organization. I think for me, I even get asked that now, even though I've been retired for a number of years, especially in the medical profession, I'll go in for some kind of medical visit and they'll you know, say, well, what'd you do before you retired? And I get varying responses, which is probably pretty much how it's been the whole time I've gotten from, oh, I'm like, I don't know what that is. Is that public health? Um, what exactly did you do? And does that mean you're trying to keep everybody from having fun? So <laughs> I think over the years, you know, I certainly had times where I was frustrated, but a lot of it was trying to get something simple, like John just said, to try to really reach people individually and say, this is what we're all trying to do in this field. And yes, injury and violence prevention is part of public health. So, You know, Susan, I also had a lot of interesting faces whenever I try to tell people what I do. Um, but my work tends to focus more on on like sexual violence. And so that was always like, you know, a showstopper. If you're at a social gathering, what do you do? I prevent rape. It's like, oh, OK. Um, and so over the years, over the last 13 years, I've just gotten more confident. I haven't developed a great pitch like you, John, but I've gotten more confident and tried to use it as a learning opportunity. So really talking about like the social aspects and different things that might contribute to the great work that we're doing and how we keep your children safe at universities and try to keep the community safe. So for me, in addition to kind of the nuts and bolts of uh, what we do and keeping it simple, you know, I give some examples, like we work on policy, you know, seatbelt laws, um, uh, safe storage of firearms, the things that'll uh, help inform folks um, about why it's important to uh, do these things to keep themselves and their loved ones and community safe and uh, how it helps all of us. So yeah, great answers. Yeah, I agree. Thanks so much for, for sharing those things because I do, I think it's something that we continue to, you know, daily have to explain what are the type, what is the type of work? So we don't have that misconception out there about what, what we're actually trying to accomplish. And so, I mean, I think we've seen the um, field of injury and violence prevention change and evolve over these past 30 years. I'm wondering if, 
you could each think a little bit about, you know, what has been the greatest overall contribution to this field during those years. Um, and again, some of us have been in the profession for five years. Some of us have been in their profession profession for 40 years. So I, I think probably each of us have a little different spin and probably depends on the injury area that you work in or the topic that you are most closely aligned with or passionate about. But curious to know, what do you think has been a, a significant contribution as we've moved through these past years? Um, so again, I, I joined the violence prevention world 13 years ago, so that's my favorite reference. Um, so for me, uh, um, one big thing that came out of CDC, giving credit there, um, is the shared risk and protective factor approach. That has been monumental, um, I think, for the work that I'm doing and great for building partnerships. And so um, being able to show that violence is actually, there's a lot of social root causes there um, and they affect multiple outcomes and that they are preventable. Um, so that often goes along with my, my conversation, even explaining violence and how we can move forward. Um, so I'll go ahead. Uh, so I am the person who's only been in this field for five long and great impactful years. <laughs> um, but with that, I think that I have seen um, just within my own hospital organization, them recognizing the importance of injury and violence prevention, not just to, you know, fix whatever's wrong with uh, someone who comes in and discharging them, but recognizing that injury and violence prevention and public health go hand in hand, and that has an, a bigger impact than, you know, necessarily the medicine part, that the getting the direct health care part. And so it's been really nice to see that um, healthcare organizations are really stepping up and acknowledging um, the work that injury and violence prevention does for the community and how that does help you know, patients and prevents them from even becoming patients in the first place, which is ultimately what we want um, as a hospital system. We don't want people to get sick anymore. If we were lived in a perfect world, hospitals wouldn't have to exist. Um, and so I think that when we look at where we were five years ago, when I entered to now, um, there's a lot more support of injury and violence prevention and um, more acceptance. And they're putting more of their resources into this field because of everything they're seeing in the community and the positive impacts we're able to have. I think I have two different perspectives. I think if you asked me that when I was working in the field, I'd probably look at things like car seats and bike helmets and seat belts and all that um, maybe a lot of the traffic stuff that we kind of take for granted now when we see it, and when we see that it's not there, that's alarming to us. But I think also in the field of, uh, opioids, I've seen a lot more. I know when I was leaving New York, it was a big struggle to get a seat at the table. No one understood where, why injury and violence would be sitting at a table where we're trying to prevent opioid misuse in New York State, you know, that took some time uh, to get people to understand that our prevention strategies were not just for unintentional, but they were for intentional and unintentional, and that there was a link between the two. And very often people didn't understand that. So there was a lot of teaching. I needed John there to give me lots of elevator speeches. We had a lot of elevators, so that would have been useful. Um, I, th I still think now, uh, when I look at the, I watch a lot of the news now, so when I look at the political issues, I think opioid misuse is still out there. People are still concerned. Arcan is not the answer to everything. And mental health, we have an increase in violence, obviously, in our communities. Seeing the role of injury and violence prevention professionals be more involved in that, I see that as a real plus. And... We have, I'm sure we still have a long way to go, but in my mind, things have kind of shifted over the years in a positive way. In the past, I think um, 1999, the landmark Insti uh, Institutes of Medicine, core functions of public health um, brought a lot to the profession because uh, as you know, national, state, and local directors started following that, the core functions of public health, of assessment, policy development, assurance administrations, if you look at the data, they came to realize how can we not be working on violence and injury prevention 
as the third leading cause of death to um, Americans. And, you know, then as tools got developed for the cost burden, you know, the, the billions and really now trillions of dollars of, of lost cost, um, it's been able to, you know, our public health and other leaders in the IVP field have been able to convince decision makers to fund this work and to, uh, um, you know, do the policy and, and other sorts of things that, that uh, help uh, reduce the, the burden. And, you know, I think about, um, you know, Susan was noting on uh, opioids and as we kind of talk about our, you know, in our, in our small county, record numbers of uh, drowning deaths, traffic deaths, uh, firearm deaths, and now overdose deaths, um, you know, a reporter was recently asking, like, you know, what's going on and why, why is this more than the other? And, you know, what's the importance of each? And it was like, well, there's no winners here. They're all terrible. We need to be working across that shared and risk and protective factors experience to, to um, try to uh, bend the curve back on, on all these things that are uh, just so profound challenges at present. Yeah, great, great responses. And I agree with everything that's been said. Um, but I, my thoughts go back further to, to around, you know, back when I started in the field in around 1994 or so, um, you know, as the, the fields of science, injury and uh, violence prevention science and programming were totally separate back then, you, you could say. And they were going on in parallel directions and, and both had their faults. They, they, they needed to benefit from each other. On the program side, there were programs going on in schools and elsewhere that had no type of evaluation. And they were high, handing out bike helmets right and left and thinking that they were making a difference and no way to prove that they were making a difference. On the science side, there was science being done that was good, but it was no effort to translate that into the real world. And they were just kind of had blinders on as well. And so I think through the organization of, of safe states back then called STIPTA, we worked very hard. Many of us on the panel worked very hard to bring the two communities together because they both benefited greatly from each other. And, and that's only become stronger and stronger um, since then. So uh, that's what sticks out in my mind, maybe what I'm most proud of being a part of. Yeah, John, that's a great segue into talking about some of the partnership opportunities that we see that will continue to improve our injury and violence prevention outcomes. I mean, I think I as well share that kind of passion for bringing research and practice together and figuring out how we can be engaged with each other but inform each other's work, because I think we couldn't do the research work that we do without really connecting with people in community in the communities that they're working in and figuring out what's working in their communities and vice versa, right? We can inform and help evaluate programs that they're doing and implementing things like that. So I think it's really good. I wonder if we could kind of take a minute and unpack a little bit about what are some other partnership opportunities that we see coming um, or new ones that maybe we haven't really tapped yet that would be just really beneficial and impactful to our field. Um, I'm just thinking about the upcoming Safe States Conference and we have um, some diverse audiences really engaged in that conference this year. So we've got um, the Department of Defense, we have the Air Force, we have Indian Health Services. So there are lots of um, groups and agencies. I'm wondering if anybody has developed a partnership that you'd wanna share about, or if you have a vision for partnerships in the future. And if not, that's okay too. <laughs> Belinda, do you have I think we all came off mute. Um, so nothing that I've done yet, but in a world where there is infinite resources and time, um, you no know, making a priority, really, I would love to engage urban planning more. I think mm -hmm. it would be really great uh, to be at the forefront as we're developing communities. Um, and as we're considering transportation issues, you know, health equity issues like that, um, I would really love to partner with them more. Um, and then personally, um, individuals who are really well versed in systems thinking, which I think the field also has, you know, come a bit of a way um, um, in that area, but those that are really well versed in that, I think we could really um, gain a lot from taking a step back and, and really evaluating our communities from a systems perspective. I think that I've um, been thinking, one of the things I've been thinking about 
is our climate crisis because of course you know we've all been saying we're hot we're you know it's too cold it's too hot it's this it's that it's the other thing but when you look at communities how are they dealing with this kind of change in their weather and then how do we help people take the preventative steps they need to do how do we help communities help people who need cooling centers or we, we need things set up we need an infrastructure in place to deal with all these different types of weather that seem to just be changing you know whether it's smoke or heat um, I'm really concerned about that and I don't know how much because uh, I'm not working in the field anymore but how much injury and violence prevention professionals are involved in that conversation but I certainly think they should be um, I think that I would love to see um, IVP become a little bit more, more integrated into tech spaces. And I think this because we want to make sure our message is getting out to as many people as possible in a way that they understand, in a way that they're able to access it. And a lot of these tech companies, their reach is is far. And some of their um, the products that they sell or services that they offer overlap with things that we want to impact, for example, um, companies like with the electric vehicles and us wanting to partner with not even just electric vehicles, but regular um, cars, uh, gasoline cars, and trying to implement some kind of uh, safety programs regarding, you know, vehicle safety, because we know distracted driving is a thing, um, and impaired driving, uh, all those kinds of things. I think that we have a huge opportunity to kind of start to integrate into some of those tech spaces to get some of our messaging out there um, and also leverage funding from those organizations as well because we have you know they can get their advertising out through some of the messages that we um, put out there and then also enhancing safety um, and decreasing violence you know when we talk about um, any firearm related companies or anything like that I think that we have a huge opportunity to start um, moving into some tech spaces and, and integrating that not only just to improve community safety but also to expand the field of IVP as a whole. When I think about partnership development and kind of growing our, our uh, partners um, that we work with, I think about um, Lindsay Meyer did last time we were in, in Colorado with the conference, and that was having uh, Governor Ickenlooper do a presentation to our general audience. And so it's a lot of work, and sometimes it doesn't always go perfectly. But when you have an opportunity to invite a key decision maker in to give a speech and you're writing that speech and it becomes like a key leader briefing as they internalize the words and sentiments that you present and you never know like in the case of uh, governor hickenlooper becoming senator hickenlooper and you know along with other colleagues and champions in, in congress uh helping understand the relevance and importance and so i i think those kinds of opportunities you know that can be media briefings where you're um you know uh, educating your own leadership as they are the MCs or presenters with the elected decision makers and bringing in the community too that are most impacted um, to be your voices uh, for, for advocacy and effort. So I think about those things as well um, as we kind of look forward to the next five or 10 years. I think there's some really big opportunities in the next uh, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, who knows how long. I'm wondering in, from, from each of your views, what do you see? I mean, so we've talked through partnerships and, and thinking through what those look like, but what could potentially be our next big opportunity in injury and violence prevention? I mean, you can see just how much Safe States has grown and advanced over 30 years, starting from a very small organization um, that some of us remember as STIPTA to now 30 years old and Safe States Alliance with a little over maybe 800 members or close to 800 members. What are some of the next big opportunities? Well, um, uh, I'm gonna just feed off what uh, Susan said a few minutes ago. I think not only is this an op opportunity, but it's gonna be a necessity to become, uh, address climate change impacts. Um, 
you know, it's just so incredible right now, whether it's the forest fires that Tony is experiencing or the heat that the rest of us are experiencing or the flooding in Southern California, hurricanes, tornadoes. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And it is something on every night's news. I mean, that's a major part of the news somewhere in, in our country and around the world. So I just think that that's going to be a necessity to, to find ways to and opportunities to um, not only combat it, but to um, react to it and, and to deal with it, you know. Um, and then the other, uh, switching gears a little bit, the other, I think, opportunity is, especially in the field of violence prevention, is um, through uh, more policy um, impact, policy directives influenced by good science. Um, I know that's pretty unpopular these days, but, you know, I'm hoping for a, a change in our in our leadership someday in this country and at the state and local and state and national level and gun laws, for instance. I just think there's so much that could be done to reduce the tragic loss of, of life due to firearms, whether it's self-inflicted or, or violence related. Um, there's a real opportunity there, I think, to make a difference, but that will require some uh, change of the political landscape. So for me, I completely agree with John in terms of policy. Um, I think a little bit more from the data perspective, which will help you know inform policy and other initiatives that we want to um, uh, see move forward. And I think I think as a field, we've already started this, but standardizing um, more of an intersectionality framework and how we're collecting data and how we're understanding who's being affected by different things. I think. The clearer we can get on our data, the, the better we'll be able to articulate what's going on in our different communities and the stronger the position will be as we're approaching, you know, political leaders and what have you. And I think, you know, the field has catch, is catching up um, and Safe States has been a great driver in this as well in terms of health equity. Um, but having the data will help us really be able to move different topic areas like going back to climate change, maybe what kind of communities are disproportionately affected and because of different things in the built environment as well. So one of the opportunities and really I think we're we're gonna have to uh, do this um, is around the whole behavioral health uh, sciences. Um, you know, we've got some uniquely American problems, uh, traffic safety, no, no other developed countries seeing the increases we are, gun violence certainly, and a whole bunch of other uh, issues kind of um, are also follow this uh, framework of the, the psyche, the behavior, just every aspect of the mental health and mental aspects of, of um, our culture has changed and, and, and often not for the better. And so um, as much as we uh, work with our, our um, data folks, we're gonna to need to work on the qualitative elements as well as the uh, behavioral and mental health aspects and learn from them how he kind of changes a population's way of um, the knowledge, attitudes, behaviors that ultimately manifest that we're seeing out there. I think we also have the opportunity to continue to break down the silos in which we're working. I think there's a lot of duplication across um, states, across organizations of the work that's being done. And I think that if we are able to connect um, amongst states and organizations, even acknowledging that you know the populations that we deal with in our individual states are different, sure, but some of the issues that we have are the same. And I think if we are able to break down some of those silos that we're working on and come together as a nation to tackle this, like you guys said, through like policy and things like that, um, I think we'll have a lot bigger impact um, if we're able to come together and deliver a sing singular message, if we're able to collect all of our data together um, and kind of look at the trends as a whole, but also drill down. And I know that's being already being done in several places. Um, but I think that we are still separated a lot and not a lot of people have access to all of the knowledge that we have access to because this is our field. And I think if we're able to get that information out there um, on a platform where people understand that they're able to access, then we'll be able to kind of push the work that we're doing a lot further um, by having that common understanding because there's pieces of information that comes out that might not be 100% accurate, might only be presented from one vantage point. And if we're able to kind of 
as a whole provide a big picture, I think we would be a lot further um, along in the field. So I think working on our communication, working on um, working together and not working individually and having this mindset of, well, this this population in for my state, Texas, is uh, is very different than the population in um, North Carolina. Our, our public health systems, our injury advice prevention systems are completely different, but coming to to recognize at the end of the day, the people that we're dealing with are people and we all need, you know, basic things, a lot of the same things. We can really come together and, you know, move that needle forward. And I see that as a fantastic opportunity for the Safe States Alliance to kind of be that organization, right, that helps us take all of what we just talked about and really move and advance the work of the field and just being able to build the partnerships that we already talked about, but then also thinking through some of these other significant issues. Um, and I think Safe States is the perfect organization to really really do that. Um, we're getting close to kind of wrapping this conversation up. I'm just curious, does anybody else have anything that they want to add um, as we celebrate 30 years and we think forward? Um, I'm just grateful that I was able to join each of you today and talk through your experiences and what you foresee um, the future being. Uh, in injury and violence prevention, but any last comments from anyone um, about Safe States Alliance or or where we see this field going? Well, I'll jump in and say, well, thank first, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. Is uh, I cherish my my memories of working in this field. Um, great work, great colleagues. It was a real joy. I, there was never a day that I didn't say I didn't like what I was doing. So congratulations on the 30-year anniversary. And I think there's nothing but a bright future for safe states. And it just continues to grow and get stronger and more influential, thanks to people like you. So thanks for inviting me. Yes, and also thank you guys for having me here today. I really appreciate it. I think Safe States is an incredible organization from the very first conference I attended while I was still in grad school. Everyone was so welcoming and informative. And I really felt like I was taken under multiple people's wings and really they fostered um, my growth. And I so much very appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to being a part of Safe States for the next 30 years. So I'll be working forever. Um, and so I think this is an incredible organization to come into at the point that we are at and see where it continues to grow and how the field continues to change and evolve and being a part of that every step of the way. Well, I'm sorry you feel like you'll be working forever, actually, but um, <laughs> hopefully it won't feel like that. I echo John and I think for me, one of the, the most heartwarming things about all this is that Lisa from the research community is president. Uh, I thought it would be a long time before I ever saw that day with safe states. Um, there was a lot of focus toward it must be a state person. And, my, and yet we were not able to always bridge the gap between research and practice and that we've come this far. And it's that Lisa's at the helm I feel really good about safe states. And yes, John, I have fond memories too. But love the field. I think part of it is the passion of the people. And they do embrace Ashley. They do bring you under their wing and, and they don't let you go. So it's true. And it is. It's it's very much a kind of a family feel. I know we always throw that out there, but do you know what I mean? There's so many good, strong connections that are like lifelong connections, right? That you develop even friendships and even more. Um, I know I have several mentors, John being one of them, Shelly being one of them, do you know what I mean, in this field. And so it's it's absolutely um, my privilege to be the incoming president and being able to lead the organization as we step into the next 30 years. So um, with that, I think we'll wrap up and just, uh, I wanna thank each of you for your time today, each of the ways that you've contributed over the past whether it be five years or 40 years, to the success of um, the Safe States Alliance, but also to the field of injury and violence prevention. So thank you so much. Um, and I'll just say be safe.